Morning, church. So good to be with you. I want to give a special welcome to those of you who might be with us for the second time after joining us for the first time for our Easter services. Yeah, great to have you back. Listen, before we jump into where we left off uh, before Palm Sunday, I want to let you know of something exciting that took place. I just got this update uh, this morning. I want to pass it on to you guys just by way of encouragement. You know, one of our partner ministries is a group called Titus Foundation, and they do some specialized training with volunteers and pastors who serve in inner city churches, inner city ministries. And so we hosted an event for them uh, last night. It was a training time, and they figured maybe 50 to 80 might show up, and there were 300. There were 300, yeah. So a lot of good work happening in the inner cities. That, but I wanted to bring that encouragement to you guys because just to say on behalf of those who participated, thank you. You know, you guys helped make that happen. So thank you for that. So we're gonna pick up where we left off uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, like I said before, Good Friday. If you're newer to the church, we've been uh, studying this ancient text written some 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians who gathered in the city of Rome. And he continues the theme in chapter 14, that's where we're at, that he's developed since chapter 12. And really the overarching theme is one of Christian love that is expressed in unity, Christian unity. Uh, this is not always an easy thing to maintain because when the people of God gather, we come together and we bring all of our, our diverse backgrounds, experiences, our cultures, and so there is opportunity for there to be, be friction. Sometimes, you know, we, we, we have a tendency to turn our preferences into our prejudices. And when this happens, it breeds disunity amongst the people of God. This is a very real concern in the first century church. And it's also somewhat of a concern, I would say, uh, today. Why is unity important? Well, Jesus said that the world will know that you are my followers by the way you treat one another. In other words, it's the idea that when all these people come together with all of their uniqueness and they are able to live in harmony with one another, well, in the first century, the world had never seen anything like it. You have Jew and Gentile sharing a meal together. It's like, what brings that about? Well, Jesus. You have Greek and barbarian coming together. How, how do those two groups mix it up? Well, you have Jesus, that's why. You have servants in the house and owners of the house coming together, sharing a meal, all under the banner of Christianity. There's a lot of opportunity for discord to take place. Christian unity is important. It, it, it sends a message to those who are not yet part of what we are and what we do. A very strong message indicating that Jesus came to unite people from all walks of life. Again, not always easy. In fact, Paul points out one specific point of dissension within the church in Rome. And it actually has to do with whether or not you ate certain foods. In Romans chapter 14, verse two, he says this, one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person, that would be weak in faith, eats only vegetables. You're like, well, what's that about? Well, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. So you had Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, again, coming together under the banner of Jesus in this new gathering called the church. So the Jewish Christians were coming from a perspective of, well, there are certain things in this life that just aren't kosher to eat. They were adhering to the Old Testament dietary restrictions. Meanwhile, Gentile believers like, well, what are you talking about? We eat it all, it's all good. We know that to the church in Corinth, there were some Christians who struggled eating meat because if you go to the local butcher and that butcher was a pagan, in all likelihood, he was going to offer some of that meat in sacrifice to his pagan gods. And so there were some Christians who were like, ah, that meat is tainted, it's not good, it's corrupted, we can't eat it in good conscience. Meanwhile, the Gentile Christians were like, what's the big deal? God created it, God owns it all. What happens when the Gentile Christian invites the Jewish Christian out to lunch? <laughs> Things could go bad fast. So Paul writes and he says, Let's talk about this weak faith, strong faith. How do we live in harmony in matters that are conviction and conscience, not matters of sin? That is where the Bible explicitly states, stay away from this, stay away from that. These things are okay, these things are not okay. The Bible spells out many of those things. That's not the issues we're talking about. We're talking about matters of conviction, 
So Paul writes to help us understand what it means to live in unity in light of some of this diversity that we have in terms of our preferences, our consciences. How, how do we all get along? How do we enter into each other's space in a way that tells those on the outside that Jesus is all about unity because his people are unified. This is not a small issue. So let me give you a summary of what he has highlighted in the first few verses of chapter 14. Number one, he says, genuinely accept one another. Don't allow issues of conscience to separate you. Number two, individual Christians can disagree over these matters of conscience and still both be perfectly right before God. Thirdly, he says, be very careful about judging your brothers and sisters in matters of conscience. And here's why. He explicitly says, every one of us will stand before God and we will give an account for our own lives. You're not gonna give an account for that person's life. That's up to them. That's between them and God. That's their business. You stay out of it. You be concerned with your relationship with God. And when you see God on that day and he holds you accountable, that's all, that's all. That, that's, that's what you concern your, your, yourself with. In verses 13 and following, he begins to parse out the nuances, the details of how exactly we do this. It's one thing to say those things, it's another to actually enter into that space and say, well, here are the practical outworkings of it. Verse 13, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer. The implication here is that we've all been doing it. <laughs> we've all been guilty of it. Paul says, we all stand before God, concern yourself with yourself, and not your brother or sister, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. So this is interesting, two different words that are used here to describe two different ways of causing people to be tripped up. The first, a stumbling block. This is an inadvertent tripping. Uh, for example, if you're moving in or out of your house, let's say, and you leave uh, one of the boxes by the front door, you open the door, you trip over the box, you fall, you stumble. That was inadvertently left there. There, there was no intentional harm in mind. But this word hindrance, that's actually a different word. The implication is there that it is intentional, that you're actually doing something to trip up a brother or sister in Christ. What Paul is saying is, whether it's inadvertent or intentional, don't do it. Don't do anything that would harm the spiritual life of those around you. And then he explains the reason behind this, verse 14. He says, I know... And I'm persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. So this is Paul's way of saying, on this issue, I actually agree with what Jesus says with regard to what's clean and what's not clean. And, Paul, and in Mark chapter seven, Jesus lays it out. And he, Jesus, called the people to him again, and he said to them, hear me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. So in other words, he says, it's not about the food. It's really not an issue of the food. It's not whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat or if you eat vegetables or don't eat vegetables. That's not what corrupts you. What corrupts a person is what comes out. It's your actions, your attitude, your words, that's what ends up corrupting you. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. They're still a little curious. They wanna make sure they understand it, verse 18. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? You don't fully understand. Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach? Now in Matthew chapter five, Jesus lays down the greatest sermon ever preached, Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. It's the Sermon on the Mount. And it's there that he speaks beyond the letter of the law to the heart of the law. He would say, you have heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, if you regard a life as worthless, you've committed murder in your heart. See, see what he does? He, he goes beyond the letter of the law and he says, let me tell you the true heart of the law. Let me tell you the law's intention and it goes way beyond your actions and it speaks to what's really going on inside of you. Because you see, y'all may have a little bit more murder in you than you give yourself credit for. It's like, oh, I haven't, I haven't actually killed somebody, I haven't taken their life. Okay, but have you ever thought in your mind, I wish that person wasn't around anymore? 
Oh, yeah, you have. Someone cuts you off in traffic. <laughs> Snowbirds are about to leave in a while. We love them. But you're quick to think, I wish they weren't on this planet anymore. And Jesus says, oh, be careful. Ah, that, there's, a, there's a spirit of murder going on inside you. Oh, and if you had the opportunity to wish that person away, you probably would. Oh, see, there's more going on. This is what Jesus says. It's not about the food. No, because when you eat something or drink something, it's not as if it affects the, the spiritual side of who you are. So what he's saying is inanimate objects in and of themselves, they are morally neutral. Uh, however, if, if a brother or sister ha was weaker in faith, if their conscience is, if their conscience is struggling by participating in it, then for them it is the wrong thing to do because it would be a violation of their conscience, even though it has been declared clean. So if, if, if a Jewish believer says, uh, you know, I just can't do it. I can't eat something that's been sacrificed to a pagan God. I just don't feel good about it. Uh, I, I, I just, I can't do it. It would, it would wreck me. Well, then you're not loving that brother or sister whose conscience is convicted if you present something to them that would cause them to stumble. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, then you are no longer walking in love. This is why they say love is the greatest Christian virtue. What is love? Love seeks the best interest of another. See, by what you eat, don't destroy the one, remember this, for whom Christ died. If Christian love seeks the best interest of another, and that brother or sister's conscience is weakened to the point that, that it is a stumbling block to see you participate in something, then what Paul says is, take the highest road possible. Because the depth of one's spiritual maturity, in part, can be determined by your willingness to put self-imposed limitations on your Christian freedoms for the sake of unity for the sake of those around you. R. Kent Hughes describes it beautifully. He says, Christian liberty is kind of like walking a tightrope. And you have that balance bar in your hand. And on one end, it's labeled Christian freedom. But on the other end, it's labeled love for others. And so when you get those two in perfect balance, you're able to walk as God calls you to walk. Not always an easy thing. A lot of nuances come into play here. One point I wanna clarify. It is the weaker Christian that is more easily offended. Isn't that interesting? Because sometimes you meet Christians and they've been Christians for years. And the attitude is this. These are the things I don't do. Therefore, because I don't participate in those things, I'm a little bit more holier than you are. Meanwhile, the one who is stronger in faith recognizes, wait a minute, wait a minute. God did not condemn those things. And when you start to condemn the things that God doesn't condemn, that leads to legalism. And then you become an accidental Pharisee because these were the guys who believed it went from God to them to everybody else. And they held sway over religious life. And they took the commands of God to where God never took them and they made it burdensome for the people. So that it was like all, all of these, these laws, ceremonial laws about keeping clean. It's like, well, wait a minute. God just said this. Yeah, God said this, but let us tell you what he meant by that. Here's how you do it. But wait, God never said to do it like that. Yeah, but listen to us. And then it was so, it's like, if you don't do it our way, you're wrong. And God is not pleased with you. And isn't it interesting? They were the ones whom Jesus had the most difficult conversations with, religious people. Now, here's a question. 
how far do we go in applying this, right? I mean, are, are we all supposed to live at the level of the weakest Christian conscience in the room? Is that a fair question? Is it right to be controlled by the narrowest, most spiritually immature among us? There are people within the church who have an unhealthy desire to be catered to. <gasps> what? <laughs> Shocking. I'll say it again. There are people in the church who have an unhealthy, disordered personality even. And their, their overwhelming desire, they crave unhealthy attention. Well, we are not called to an indiscriminate or uncritical limitation to our freedom. This does require great discernment, not always easy. And the mature are called to give instruction to the weak in faith as well. And, and that's actually what you see Paul doing here. Because he says, well, now I agree with Jesus. So this is, this is a little bit of a shot to those who are weak in faith. He's, Paul says, well, I do agree with what Jesus says and that actually the meat will not defile you. So I agree with him. So what's he doing? He's actually lifting people up to maturity. He's saying, here's something for you to think about. You can partake. You can. It's okay. Now, some are still childlike in their faith. And so what happens is when, you, when you're raising a child, you expect a toddler to act like a toddler, but at the same time, you expect that toddler to grow up and mature. How is that made possible? Well, you're setting the bar a little bit higher with each life stage, you know? Just a little bit more, you're capable of doing this. Here's what you need to know, here's what you need to do. Now, okay. I'm going to say some things. I'm gonna make some comments on the culture that I think are particularly challenging and disruptive and have very often crept into the church that prohibit us from seeking the highest road possible and serving those around us. Because what happens is when we serve ourselves above others, we destroy Christian unity. So here's what's happening in our, in, in, in our culture today. So many people are living at the level of their diagnosis. In my opinion, we have too much therapy today. There's a lot of, a lot of things that go down in the name of therapy that actually end up being very unhealthy. We've got people using therapeutic language in ways that are not actually justifiable. And it seems that many people carry some form of diagnosis. Now, listen, let me say this. I majored in, in philosophy and psychology, okay? So I understand there are some very helpful aspects of therapy. But I think it's gotten a little out of hand in our time. People are living at the level of their diagnosis. And what's happening is you're hearing people say, well, I can't do that because I am this. People are using therapeutic language in ways that are unjustifiable. I'll give you an example. I had a young lady approach me and she said, Pastor, I need to talk to you about some recent therapy or some recent trauma in my life. I said, okay, let's talk about it. What's going on? She said, my boyfriend broke up with me. Okay, that's not trauma. <laughs> Listen to what I'm saying. That ain't trauma. I'm here to tell you, that's life. That happens to everybody. But when you start using therapeutic speak for every little incident that happens in your life that you don't want, here comes your diagnosis. And with that, the expectation that you would now live at the level of your diagnosis and nothing more. So when I, when I tore my, I didn't tear my ACL, it's gone. Ripped it in half, scrolled up in the back of my knee. You go through this process called, I didn't have the surgery, because what happens is, as you start to get older, 
um, the doctors tell you, well, at your age, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You know, it's like one, as my dad would say, one foot in the grave, one on a banana peel. And you're like, all right. <laughs> so at your age, you should think not about surgery, but you should just think about physical therapy. So I'm like, oh, who wants to do surgery? So I did physical therapy. Okay, who wants to do physical therapy? <laughs> Holy cow, that hurt worse. But you do understand what happens in physical therapy? There's an understanding that this is gonna be very painful and you're gonna have to endure this pain. You're gonna have to strengthen the, the MCL, you're gonna have to strengthen the patella, you're gonna have to strengthen all the muscles around it to compensate for that muscle that is not, for that limit, ligament that's not there anymore. And it hurt. It hurt. The therapy was meant to be painful so that I could get to a higher place on the other side. We have a lot of people that are like, hey, this is your diagnosis, and so this is the way you are. And by the way, again, if you wanna know one of the dirty little secrets, obviously, of therapy, it's um, become a therapy for kids, a therapist for kids. Because, now, let me just say, you can spare me this email at least. <laughs> there, there is a healthy form of therapy, but a lot of it is unhealthy, okay? There's a healthy form of therapy for children. But if you can get into the business of offering therapy for children, you're set. Because you'll have parents who will pay endless amounts of money for that. And it's really, it can be challenging to get a child where a child needs to be even as they age because they can be very easily manipulated. So we're just, we're just one, not, not everywhere, but it's one of the dirty little secrets of therapy. You wanna be wealthy in therapy? That's what, that's what they tell you, going to child therapy. And so we, we have all of these people just, just sort of uh, in, in their state of 24-7 focusing on their problems, they're making it worse. And their depression is becoming greater. By every metric, the younger generations are not doing well. And they have more therapy than ever. Something's wrong. So what the scripture says is actually very enlightening. If you want to level up yourself, Stop thinking about yourself so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, start thinking about how you can be a blessing to those around you. Get your eyes off of yourself and onto others, and all of a sudden, your own psyche and well being, you experience some freedom from that. You move beyond the level of your diagnosis into the space where God has you blessing other people. And then what happens is the coolest thing. You're like, you know what, man? I'm experiencing God's favor on my life because I'm helping those around me. So a great opportunity to remind you, our church is like any other. We are healthy only to the degree that you all are plugged in, serving, exercising your spiritual gifts, and blessing one another. If you all stop doing that, we're done. So there's the question for you. How can I be a blessing to both the strong and the weak in my church. Additionally, Paul gives further instruction. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is quite good. He lifts the conversation into an entirely different level. He says, by the way, don't focus on the external things, eating and drinking, focus on the eternal. Eternal things like righteousness. What is righteousness? This is like the big Christian polysyllabic word to, to act right, to think right, to do right, to use the scriptures as your guide. That will lead you into righteousness. Your time on this earth is very short lived. Don't make such a big deal out of earthly things. That's what he's saying. Um, eternally minded people pursue the things that really matter. Peace, joy. Jesus mentioned this in Matthew chapter five. Again, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So many people are pursuing what is unrighteous, and that's why they're so dissatisfied. So whether you're strong or you're weak, the exhortation is, is to live as if this world was not your home. Verse 18, 
Whoever thus serves Christ, if you serve Christ, that's what makes you acceptable to God. And in the same way, by serving God, you end up serving others, you will be approved by men. Apart from this, what you're left with is the God of your own self-made tyrannical attitude. If you're not entering into the space where you're thinking about others, that space will be filled. And when you begin to serve yourself, you become an absolute monster in the worst way possible. You, it becomes tyrannical. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not for the sake of food destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean. He makes it clear again. But it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. So the mature Christian will ask himself or herself this question. Is what I'm doing building others up, especially those who are younger or weaker in the faith? And if the answer is no, then I have to stop. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. Again, self-imposed limitations, the highest, highest road. By the way, the Greek word for good here is a really cool one. It was often used to describe beauty in life, beauty. And so what he's saying is, you can create beauty on this planet. And the way you create beauty is by not tripping others up, by doing good, promoting unity. And, and, and the beautiful thing about this is you recognize secondary issues, very finely, finely tuned sense of one's Christian walk. The faith that you have, he speaks to the mature, keep between yourselves and God. Because blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. So again, this is an interesting statement. What he's saying is, it's possible to bring judgment on yourself because you do something that destroys the faith of someone who is weaker. He says, don't do that. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. You know what he's saying? You know what, because I'm strong in the faith, it's perfectly acceptable for me to do this and no one's gonna tell me what I can or can't do. All of a sudden, you've just proven yourself to actually be weak in the faith. I think I told you guys a story about Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a super fiery English preacher. He died in 1892. He was a wordsmith, articulate, powerful preacher, huge presence, and very fond of smoking cigars. And he was asked by a woman, rather rudely, Pastor, why do you smoke a cigar? She used the definite article. Why do you smoke a cigar? Now, Spurgeon's bright. He responded according to her inquiry. Why do I smoke a cigar? I smoke a cigar because I can only fit one in my mouth at a time. <laughs> a cigar? If I could smoke more than one, I would, but I can only fit one in my mouth at a time. Sometime after this, he was walking down the streets of London, passed by a cigar shop, and there was a sign in front, and it said, we sell the cigar Charles Spurgeon smokes. <laughs> and he never smoked another cigar since. Why? Because he realized, wow, is that what I wanna be known for? <laughs> Is that the sign I want on the streets of London describing me? Preferably, we sell the Bibles Spurgeon reads from. You know, something like that maybe. But he never smoked another cigar afterwards, why? Because he was very mature. <laughs> you get it? Do I, want, do I want people to think of me and identify me with that? No. No, I need to give that up. Final words to the less mature. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is actually sin. In other words, if you can't do something with a clean conscience, then you shouldn't do it. Now, let me be quick to add this. Your conscience is an infallible guide. <laughs> you should not always be led by your conscience. See, the mature Christian 
wants to have a question answered. And the question is this, what do the scriptures say? Not always, how do I feel about this? Because we live in a society that is, so what's happened is just for, from, an, so from an epistemological standpoint, in other words, how do we get to this place? How do, we, how do we know what we know? How do we process information? How have things changed? Why have things changed? There has been a shift in our thinking. The modern man thought, I think therefore I am sort of this idea that Descartes would, would elevate man's mind to the center of reality and man is a rational being and we can figure this stuff out if we only apply our minds to it. This is what was so profound about Star Trek when Star Trek came out because the hero, typically one of two people, either the captain or Spock. Why Spock? Because he was logical. And if we can just apply logic and human reason, we will break free. We live in a postmodern context. No longer is it, I think, therefore I am. It is now what? I feel, therefore I am. So now you have a little bit of insight as to what's happening around you from a cultural perspective. It's not about what is reasonable, it's about how I feel. There's a lot of things wrong with this. Your conscience is, is, is fallible. What do the scriptures say? Let me give you a quick four point summary of what Paul is saying so it doesn't get lost on us. Number one, don't be a stumbling block to the weak. Consider how your freedoms are affecting others. Number two, live for the eternal, not the external. Three, pursue that which benefits others. Number four, do everything with a clean conscience. So. Here's the beautiful thing about Christian unity. We're not all the same. We have different preferences. We don't want to allow those preferences to become our prejudices because prejudices absolutely destroy unity. We can put self-imposed limitations on our freedoms for the sake of unity. Jesus brings us together under the same banner so that we can be unified, so that the world looks and says, wow, in the midst of all of their distinctiveness, they're getting along. Not only that, but they genuinely love each other. So we have a lot to pray for. Father, our sincere desire is that you would speak to us in this moment. Give correction where it needs to be brought, encouragement. Father, we are thankful for the unity we have in this place, and yet there are opportunities and moments all around us to increase the harmony even within our congregation. Lord, I pray for those who are just beginning this faith journey. And perhaps today they've been challenged to pursue something higher and greater and more noble. I pray for those who are stronger in the faith as we come alongside in a way that enables people to move from, as the author of Hebrews says, milk to meat, solid food for the mature. Because Lord, in the end, we do wanna live for what is eternal, not for what is external. Only the things that are done for you are the things that last forever. Help us into that, we pray. We ask it in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, and God's people said, amen. amen.